our, our topic fits right in and we need to see what, what do we do as individuals, what do we do as society to, to achieve those big objectives, to make the world a better place. And then through that exchange of, of uh, what we know, what we've learned, uh, we'll, uh, we'll move into our panel. You know, the quick quote to open was, there is, uh, um, David Lipman said uh, that if you're three years behind in tech, you're uh, a century behind. <laughs> so we don't want to be a century behind, so we'll jump right to it. Um, I will not introduce the speakers. They'll do it better than me. Uh, what, what I want to hear is, what is it you do quickly? And then um, one thing that, that you believe is the most, uh, uh, most impactful, most meaningful in your work uh, and, and, and how that contributes to uh, big overarching goals. Maybe I'll go to Elise first. Uh, she's representing Switzerland, our host, so maybe we'll start there. Hi everyone, my name is Alizé and I'm one of the co-founders of Seedstar. So we, um, our aim is to have an impact in emerging markets and for that we participate in the capaci capacity building with where we operate the biggest startup competition and we have different incubation and academy centers to train not only entrepreneurs but businesses rising in these markets. And on the other side, of course, we invest in these companies and impact-driven businesses around the world. For me, what is most impactful is the idea that I'm building a team where we were four years ago three people and today a hundred and hopefully we'll continue to scale. Um, in terms of impact, what we look at, for us job creation is very important, I think especially in these markets and I do fundamentally believe that impact investing is also a packaged word for Europe and tomorrow it will be called something else and yesterday it was a bit around social entrepreneurship. So for us, our, the focus is more helping these businesses which fundamentally support the bottom of the pyramid. So by default, when you're looking at financial inclusion, when you're looking at education, healthcare, etc., they're all very impactful by default. Um, so yeah, if I had to choose one metric, it would still be job creation. Very good. Yeah, uh, I'll go. I'll go to Denise next, and uh, maybe a question for you is: is what is social boost, and and how do you see the purpose and the mission of your organization? Well, uh, uh, thank you very much. We are very proud to be here at the panel uh, because it's Davos, because it's uh, Ukraine House first ever in Davos, and uh, Social Boost is a Ukrainian NGO. Uh, we were formed five years ago and uh, now we're 22 people mostly trying to build uh, the IT tools that change the world and bring better future uh, and uh, organize the efficient cooperation between government, startups and uh, impact investors. Uh, Western NS Fund was our first investor and I really appreciate this investment because Social Boost was at the forefront of Ukrainian open government data reform and uh, because of the efforts of grassroots and street activists we made it possible and also this sparked the whole wave of startups that uh, changed the face of the country, became public-private partnerships, became standalone startups became new services of the newly ele elected government. And uh, this cooperation and, uh, b between uh, these different stakeholders is something that we are now experiencing in neighboring Eastern European countries. So uh, the uh, idea of Social Boost is to promote this kind of tools to neighboring countries and basically to uh, look into the impact first and then to returns because most of the startups are uh, successful, they found their investment in the recent year and a half we launched something around 50 startups and they uh, fundraised almost one million dollars and uh, I think that uh, we are very proud of uh, Ukrainian society showing the example in uh, Eastern Europe how government startups and uh, private investors could really work together to have some sustainable and uh, really positive results. And this model is something that we would like to promote and show Ukrainian uh, example to the world and basically to the region in the first place. Well, thank you, thank you for that. It's, you know, when you think of, of a tech entrepreneur, 
those individuals are not motivated by making billions of dollars. If, if that's the goal, they don't necessarily succeed. Uh, usually there's a vision and a mission and, and I think Denise's example of entrepreneurs coming in and saying, we need to make a contribution to our country and, and that motivates them and, and your shop enables them to, to, to do better. This is great. Uh, next I'll go to Chidi Yoga, a former colleague and a good friend uh, and then it'll be good to, to hear your story, um, how, how your organization, how your work uh, delivers something to society and, and how that, that matters. Fantastic, thank you, Andrew. Um, so my name is Chidiogo, and I am the founder of a group called She Roars. It stands for Reimagining Our Africa Rising. And I'm really not here to talk about what I do, but really what I represent. And I think uh, for me is one of the many faces of the new Africa. And that's really captured by its youth. You've all heard about the, the youth bulge, right? The youngest continent, 2050. There's a lot of potential there. I worked for many years leading a community of young people across every African country in the thousands and really see that they're called global shapers. You might have met some of them. And global shapers really represent this energy of the youth that is, is all about social good. We represent a generation that is moving away from perhaps a profit-driven mindset, definitely a, a, a selfish mindset of own personal gains, but really thinking of the whole and what Africa Rising means for all of us and how we can participate. So I'm playing my part and she roars in holding space for women, having uh, integrative ex experiences and events for women uh, to unleash their full potential, so to say. And this is across Africa, working on a Pan-African scale and working really hand in hand with other like-minded individuals that are looking to support various groups, youth, women, entrepreneurs, and seeing that that's where the magic happens when we really all collaborate and are true to the African proverb that we all hold so dear, that to go fast, you go alone, and to go far, you go together. Thank you. That's, it's important to point out that you launched your uh, initiative before WEF chose to uh, to create an all female uh, co-chair, so uh, <laughs> so you capture the diet guys and and maybe to quote uh, is it Justin Trudeau, one of the most enlightened heads of uh, state, he said that I'm a feminist and and so should you all be and and I think mm -hmm. you know talking about your work I, I I very much applaud you this is great thank you, thank you. Um, I you know Jean Baptiste will go to you next and I think it's interesting that. Um, um, is, is keen on tech and, and, and there is a, a, an idea that with tech solution you come in and, and then you deal with a problem. But on the other side, you know, tech creates a bunch of problems so we try to solve it with yet more tech and then if we think about it, you know, the, the fake news or whatever you take, a phenomena we're coping with, some of it is generated out of thin air by tech and, then, and, and that's almost like an infinite loop and it may not even go in the right direction. So what's, uh, what, what do you do? How do you contribute? Tell yeah, us your story. Uh, uh, thank you. So my name is uh, Jean-Baptiste. And I'm very happy by this panel today because, you know, I've been working on these issues for 15 years. I've been working on free software, open content. I was the first chief legal officer of Wikipedia. Um, and uh, for long, you had all these people trying to do good through technology, but they didn't identify as a movement. Okay, And we see with uh, impact investing, we see with civic tech, people trying to identify as a more global movement than just like, for example, free software. See, which is already something very good and difficult to achieve, and people were really keen on trying to do something well with the technology they were developing. But now we are trying to go a more, it, it's more global and it's bigger. And so I'm really happy to see this discussed that way today and especially uh, at, at the Ukraine house. No, th thank you, maybe I'll, I'll, since you're keeping your interest short, I'll ask you, I'll ask you a question on, um, on Wikipedia. I think it's, to me, it's, it's absolutely the most fantastic example of, of how crowdsourced solutions how organization that all it has is its mission somehow brings such value to society. On the other hand, the counter argument is, is profit motive is what's gotten us to where we are. You know, businesses run because 
people are making contributions, they see they see how that generates revenue and that innovation comes from from that loop. What's your sense? Is are we gonna say twenty years from now? Is everything gonna be crowdsourced? You know, profit secondary, or or is that motivation gonna remain? You know, entrepreneur is a French word. Okay, it's it's and it's not. It's it's actually entrepreneurs the first ones who are people who are trying to cross the Atlantic to discover new things. They were not that much after money. They were they had an idea and they wanted to discover things and that what's were motivating them. Money is always second. And if you look at the most valuable companies today, s most of them and some of the most innovative companies are actually very old. IBM is a very old company. They are on spot on everything with in artificial intelligence and everything like that. Nintendo Nintendo has been created in 1881, right? Maybe 1889, I don't remember. But these companies are all very innovative. Why? Because they have been cautious to pursue their mission. And we have been, maybe with the digital revolution these last few years, we have been forgetting that when you build a company, you just, you're not just trying to, to make money. You want to do something. What do you want to do? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it long lasting? Is it maybe it can be short term? Maybe some entrepreneur uh, ventures can be like really for like the next three or five years, but some of them want to be there for a long time. And it's a very good thing that people are coming back to that. And that instead of trying, I, I, I mean, I'm a lawyer, okay? So for the last five years, maybe, I've seen people trying to to be very cautious about their shareholders' agreements, trying to understand how much money they would get in that case, in that other case, and so on. No. Today, what they are trying to write well in their bylaws and stuff like that is that the mission of the company. What will it do? Why do we put money together? Why do we, we agree to spend three, five years together doing nothing else because we want to achieve this? I, I think it's a known phenomenon now that the millennials would not take a job unless they can know why, you know, what what brings them to this. Can they identify with that, with that objective? Yeah, now, for the second half, I, I'll just ask one question of all panelists, and then we'll go goes with you guys. Uh, um, Elise, you, you mentioned this idea of, of impact investment and, and job creation. You know, there's some challenges to this notion that you know, are we even going to have work in a, in the format that we understand? Are those jobs? Is that even, you know, a long-term uh, strategy? Um, but but the other question is is impact investment is is kind of a new phenomena and it separated from regular investment. But are we going to see the same transition? You know, the digital economy is a term that outlived itself because digital economy is the economy, right? And and. Will everything become impact investment? Are you going to be able to work in an investment space that uh, that is somehow separate from that? And uh, and the question I wanted to ask, sorry for a uh, long intro, but the uh, question I wanted to ask of all panelists is what lessons can we learn? You know, there is this um, expectation that uh, the OECD countries, the developed economies, they, they hold the truth, they hold the best practices and... and and the rest of the world looks up and then adopts those practices and then somehow we all succeed in the long term. But that's fundamentally not true. We learn from each other, every context is different. And I wanted to think of exact examples. You know, what is it that, that you could you, that you do that could work in the emerging market? So what did you yourself learn from emerging economies that you've adopted in, in your uh, in your work? Oof, there's a lot of <laughs> topics there, but um First of all, I hope uh, the idea of doing business and doing good becomes synonymous so that you should by default be doing business with a thought of good. So it's more about talking about the integrity and the ethics of a business versus pursuing kind of this packaged good because a lot of people are trying to build their own impact portfolio because they know it's more attractive on the market, but it's a bit more about packaging than fundamentally believing it in your strategy and vision. 
Um, and so, yes, I hope, and I think we are a generation more and more by emergency, so it's not us cautiously wanting to be good, but we have no choice of rethinking how the sustainability of the earth and the environment. And also, by the way, we grew up that we do really need this purpose and the idea of the bigger long-term mission of what we, what we want to aim for in our personal and, and the lives of our community. So, yes, I hope impact will become the way we invest tomorrow. Um, and then in terms of uh, clear examples, it, it's difficult in the sense that um, I think the lines have completely been blurred between the north and the south on very different subjects because we're seeing this leapfrogging phenomena and we can even talk about is emerging markets going to leapfrog directly to the fourth industrial revolution and skip the third <coughs> industrial revolution. I mean, there are a lot of challenges around this where we realize that, okay, in terms of financial inclusion, there was less lobbying, regulation, customer heritage that allowed mobile payment to spread faster in certain regions versus the uh, more developed economies. Uh, this is one example where it's going to be more of a reverse innovation of it coming back uh, to the north. But innovation will come really, the, the, the world is, is flat in many ways, so innovation will come from all parts uh, in niches and verticalized on specific industries and you will uh, you will see the future of artificial intelligence uh, in, in, in Vietnam or Singapore versus other continents that will take over. So. I'm, I'm less and less uh, categorizing the north, the south, the west, the rest. Um, it, thank God to globalization, it's getting more and more blurred. Interesting. No, this is this is great, uh, great optimism. If we think of, uh, I don't know, quintessential innovation example, uh, Tesla, right? It's a uh, hundred thousand dollars car, uh, and you know. It's great that it's been developed and it's an icon, but there's, I think, Tata Group is working on on a, a vehicle that will be, you know, as as an expensive, like a bicycle price for, and then and if that happens, that could shift uh, the um, the balance in in favor of electric vehicles. So it's interesting that you say that the lessons are no longer going one way or the other. It's it's the the grassroots, and and I liked your uh, your idea of skipping the the third industrial revolution. And, and if I had to guess, I think Denise is already operating in the space of fifth industrial revolution, looking beyond, uh, and, and leapfrogging is, is uh, kind of the base minimum. So uh, tell me, tell me uh, what, what lessons you think from, from your experience are useful for, for the uh, emerged uh, economies or developed economies, or what lessons you picked up from, uh, uh, from outside? Um, I had a privilege to uh, serve as the advisor to the Prime Minister of Ukraine because uh, of uh, recent developments that uh, open data reform they allowed our country to have. And uh, based, on, based on this experience, it seems like the investment climate is really changing right now and there is a big shift of paradigm. So if we think about five years ago, there were a lot of sprints, Arabic sprints, some other sprints. So people were on the, on the rise and using digital technologies to have a voice and to have some impact. Right now, what we are seeing is that in Eastern Europe, people still do not trust governments at full amount, uh, to softly call this somehow, right? And uh, what we are seeing there is that families and family offices are uniting to basically pursue the same goal that all these springs were trying to pursue. To have an impact, to improve the countries, to improve the narrative, to change the political agenda, social agenda, to solve uh, the challenges like unemployment, uh, quality of life, uh, and all other issues like education, transportation, infrastructure, healthcare. And they can really do this because technology and capital united, they can have this influence. And uh, this is uh, a very interesting moment in uh, the history of Europe because this is when uh, Eastern countries can really uh, be an example uh, and show some lessons to the Western world. Because prior to this, uh, d developed economies definitely had a voice and they could uh, 
show uh, they, ca they, they, they could be the role model for their less developed countries and uh, less developed countries uh, were really uh, fond of following these examples but right now because uh, mm, developing economies have different challenges and they have different approach to solving these challenges these hybrid models uh, really pay off and they demonstrate a really high viability and a positive example to the West. I think that in Ukraine in particular, civic technology and uh, services like uh, Prozoro, like uh, open data reform, uh, like very unexpected services, for example, open booking at the cemetery, for example, which is super anti-corrupt and monetized service, they all showed that people can really do the change, they can monetize their own efforts, and there is a space for the impact investor. And civic tech promotes impact investing, and it really somehow catalyzes the uh, entrance of impact investors to the Central European region, which was not the case before. No, thank you, thank you for that. I actually, if I could contribute uh, on this very topic, I, I, when you look at, uh, if you followed Ukraine uh, recent uh, history, there was this challenge of leadership. Uh, the, the previous administration was failing completely. Uh, we're talking about Yanukovych era. And then once, once that leadership bankrupted itself and, and things started to change, uh, the tech world stepped up to that challenge, stepped up to the challenge of leadership, to the challenge of dealing with the problems in the ways that allowed for that leapfrogging and 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 i think you should all chat with denise and, and learn a bit more about his projects and 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 where that field is playing a role and and what i think if i could again sum up countries in transition is where experimentation happens where where things are dynamic when you know things are evolving at a different pace and and that's where i think there is an edge for uh, for emerging economies to introduce things that no one else would think of. Um, what do you guys have to contribute? Should you go next to you? Absolutely. On that topic of the innovation that can arise from uh, developing markets, maybe I'll just paint a picture of what it looks like in Nigeria, where I'm from. We have a joke that speaks to every household being its own local government. So what does that mean? You're providing your electricity. You have your generator running. You're providing your security. You probably have some sort of security person mechanism in place. You're providing your own water supply. You're buying water from uh, a tank that comes in and provides your work. You're taking care of your own waste disposal. Some people even tar the roads around their houses. So this is to say there's the challenges are so, that the, the things perhaps in other countries you take for granted are still real challenges that there are solutions to, but very much fragmented. And that's where technology comes in, right? Because technology can leapfrog. Technology can really bridge these uh, ch uh, crucial challenges that still exist. So from that, you have innovations. You might have all heard of M-Pesa. M-Pesa is the solution that is most often cited because it came from really that local understanding that financial inclusivity was uh, financial access access to finance was a difficult and uh, real challenge in the Kenyan economy. So how do you, um, people have mobile phones because there's been leapfrogging from 15,000 uh, people with their landlines to a couple 800 million across Africa with mobile phones. So there is that leapfrogging that technology uh, exemplifies. So in that example, M-Pesa provided payment options for people to transfer money from mobile to mobile suddenly that created incredible, incredible opportunities in the market. At the same time, some challenges. So that innovation could not have happened in Silicon Valley or wherever else you might want to look because that challenge did not exist there. So really what I'm getting at is that the, for the, innov the innovation comes from a true understanding of, of the challenges that exist. But a true understanding can only get you so far. You need the developers and the know-how that can actually implement the, the you know, that can really take it to the next step. And this is where you have the Andelas that, you know, Facebook invest, invested $24 million in a company that's just a few years old that really was training developers, understanding that they're crucial, not only um, in, in um, providing um, 
great skills beyond the continent and beyond the country, beyond Nigeria and beyond the continent of Africa, but to really make sure that the continent is growing a critical layer of a backbone for the future, what we need, which is the expertise to bring forward these innovations. So that being said, I think the learning is really to, to empower the innovations that the potentials for innovation that are still right now, you know, sometimes non-existent and in a dream phase and really know that that is the magic that will transform the continent. But magic is tempered with the role of government in really stepping in and working hand in hand with with the investors, with the with the with the with the with the Startups is the word I'm looking for to really make sure that there is there's a that each step is a is a is a strong one forward to achieve the the change that we are all hoping to see in our generation. Great, yeah, this is this is excellent. I think Impesa is 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 that example uh, where you know West is lagging behind, far behind, and and maybe Jean Baptiste to you. Um, Europe led on technology for the longest time, Europe or, or uh, the OECD world. And now you look at, say, solar energy. Uh, China, I think, produces more solar capacity than the rest of the world together and, and is just pushing ahead. Of course, China is no longer uh, a developing economy, but are we, are we, do we see this dynamic in your experience? Have you picked any lessons from uh, outside of France or outside of OECD? Well, I, I the, the interesting thing with technology is that the Western world doesn't have that many lessons to give to anyone else, okay? Um, it, it's not to say that the contrary is true either. It's more like we should be always very cautious about technology. It can be a very good thing or very stupid and bad thing. It really depends on the amount of attention you, you, you give to it. I, I, I'll give just one example. So in France last year, we had a huge scandal because um, we changed, we decided to automatize um, the, the way people are, um, can go to universities. So in France, universities are free. So it's no big deal, everybody's happy. We have, uh, uh, and after high school, you just have to choose between like three, four, five different universities. You say what you want to do. And then after studying your, uh, your, 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 your grades in high school, they decide to send you there, there, or there, okay? And that's actually a long and time consuming process. So last year, it was decided to automatize that process. And since nobody cares, and since nobody actually thought that, bringing some attention to the technological details, to the way it was being done. Here is what was being done. Um, so it was, uh, bring it, <laughs> it was um, they, they gave it to a developer, a one, one guy actually, alone, who decided that the best way to actually attribute university places to people would be randomly. <laughs> and because that's the most efficient way. And so he decided to do it randomly. <laughs> and then people were, randomly attributed this or that university, and of course, nobody was happy, everybody was angry. People who had very good grades were going to stuff that they didn't care about. People who had, were actually aiming a little too high, uh, were, uh, and so on. So we had to redo everything, but you see, it's, the lesson is not that uh, technology in itself, is, it's never neutral. The algorithm you will choose, like for example, a random, uh, a random, I don't know what, algorithm, uh, is a ch it's a choice. You have to think about it, be careful. But on the opposite, we are now seeing in France, but also in the UK, in Germany, everywhere, uh, a trend of bike sharing. We see many, many Chinese bike sharing companies coming in our cities with free floating models. I don't know if you see what's free floating, like you just put, it's the same thing in the US and everywhere. Well, uh, when you look at the result in China, well, everybody is like, but we don't want that. That's not the technology we want. And uh, we don't want to, imp even if it's a good idea in China, and I'm not sure it is, but even maybe because they are little, uh, they don't have the same investment in, uh, in, uh, in uh, transportation that we have. They don't, they don't have our history. It's not the same thing. And we should be cautious about importing models. But in every sense, like, it, it, there, there is, it's complicated to, 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 to look at something that's working somewhere 
and to decide that it should be the same thing somewhere else. So what's working in Africa, in Nigeria, will probably not work in France. And what's working in France maybe will not work in Ukraine. You see, we need to be smart and look at the lessons and try to understand, but spend time when we choose. That's really the thing that people are trying to avoid. They just want this like to be automatic, like, oh, this is working there. I will do the same thing in my country. Oh, yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> no, th I think this is, I think, Everybody experienced that, right? There is every entrepreneur in any country wants to build an Amazon of that or yeah. this and or Uber of this or that, and it may may not yeah. be a good idea. I want to be you, the the Uber of hospitals. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now over to you. Uh, come up with your questions, comments, uh, Orisa, maybe uh, if you already raised your hand. So. First of all, I want to congratulate Western AS Enterprise Fund for being a pioneer of impact investment in Ukraine because I think they're really paving the way so far in Eastern and Central Europe and possibly in the whole of the post-Soviet space because if we manage to have it working in Ukraine, we can have it working in Russia, in Kazakhstan, in other countries that come from a different <coughs> history and legacy of economy and, and, and citizens. But here I have a question to Denise and sorry, I don't remember your name. Shidiogo. Um, yesterday the president of EBRD was speaking here with the president of Ukraine and he said number one challenge of Ukraine is governance. And it's how citizens interact with the state, how citizens interact with the economy. I want you to say briefly if you have some solutions coming from civic tech, from impact investment, for how citizens change their behavior and how we change government because we seems like talking about all those revolutions, how we produce added value in economy, but how we govern, it seems like comes from the beginning of the 20th century in a way. Yeah. The old tools of uh, you know elections and oversight and accountability. Maybe we're missing some opportunities that can, we can take on board in governance. Thank you. I want to be sure I understand the question. You are interested in understanding how we can think differently about governance. Oh, no, how we can do governance differently. Fantastic, fantastic. That's the space I'm in. I believe, well, I'm going to just start from my belief personally on the role that women have to play, right? Because you're looking at, um, and it's not just about women, it's the, the under, underrepresented. There's always a role there because governance ultimately has to encompass the, 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 as much as possible be representative. And right now to have governments that are not, do not include their women in powerful positions that can amplify change, that can bring in different perspectives, given also the research that shows the role that women that are working in heads of companies have improving efficiency, we see that that's a powerful and underutilized potential. So I'm working in a space of not only having that dialogue, but empowering the women themselves to really own up to the power that they have. Because we're coming from a culture perhaps of this empowerment that it's not overnight, well, go now and do it. There has to be that deep belief in one's own ability. So that being said, I think values is at the core of how we must think government governance. And it mustn't be a space that one thinks of politics cannot be a space to enrich in oneself. And I'm very, I'm very optimistic that this generation is moving away from that mindset, but at the same time, very realistic that we have very few role models, right? Because who is showing you the way in terms of countries that you're seeing governance that is working for the benefit of the people and not for self and gratitement that you don't become a multi-millionaire after you hold a space of governance. Of gov governance. So that being said, the dialogue is changing because you know we have with the global shapers that I, I really are this represent this young dynamic group speak to you know the beautiful the beautiful ones are born you know the, where the ones we've been waiting for there's that narrative that you're hearing in the context that I come from and it's really how do you support that narrative to fruition how do you get investors that are 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 investing in tools that are holding the existing governance accountable, media that is using technology to amplify um, cases where there's been irregularities, citizen participation to know that we all have a role to play. It's not to leave it to governments, it's to say, what can I do in my own small role as an entrepreneur, as a citizen? 
And that could just be to use the existing technology to raise my hands and you know speak to something that is not going well during an election period, um, holding a government accountable, using social media. There's a powerful voice that is there now. So I think times are changing. Um, the people, the mindset is changing, and there's a need to really support that change, bring all stakeholders, all players, so that we can have a powerful leapfrog that is to own it into the future that it's the time is now, and if not now, we might lose a, fun, a, a critical period in time. Thank you. Thank you, Chidioga. If I could jump in with just one brief comment. I, I worked in the world of international development, and it's uh, proven by data that one and only most uh, significant policy that will enable economic success is education of girls. Women empowerment is the single most important factor in development. And, and one more quote <coughs> I picked up yesterday, I spoke to a, a managing director of uh, Hendrick and Struggles, a big uh, firm uh, deciding who sits on boards, and, and gentleman explained that majority of European countries moved into the world where it's mandatory that your board is no more than 40% one gender and the other. And it's not about 40% women, it's 40% of, a, uh, is, is a threshold, right? And, and, and that's, I think it's, to an American it sounds strange, you don't legislate that. But in Europe, this has been accepted and there is, in, in, in that's a way to proceed. And I think that's an interesting lesson to, to. Can I just add to that by saying the case studies coming now from Africa, Rwanda, as a positive example, and guess what, the parliament, Gender parity, 50, more than 60%, I think, are women. Um, and the private sector, Safaricom, comes up a lot. They're the ones that started M-Pesa that I mentioned, hire a large amount of female executives. So when we're looking at the positive case studies and we're looking what's the difference there, you'll be surprised that the X factor is having women that are empowered to, to, to top positions of leadership. And, and the reason we're having such an awesome panel, and the reason this Ukraine house is such success, it's uh, run mainly by women. So, <laughs> a round of applause. <laughs> Denise, what, what, what's your take? Uh, what's the role of tech w to in governing? Like, how do we change? Yeah, actually, there are so many women involved with tech in Ukraine. So first of all, Ukraine, more than 100,000 certified IT professionals, and it really pays off, especially it paid off during the revolution of dignity. And we see more and more girls and women actually getting into the uh, startup business, creating some tools. Recently, we have started a 1991 Civic Tech Center in the center of Kiev. And, uh, it, it, it was a donation from uh, Media Net Network, and uh, it is now populated by 50-something uh, startup companies that really want to cooperate with the government, uh, develop their tools to another level, and basically improve the country somehow. And um, I would just go down to the example so that you have a sense what's going on there on the ground. So there is a group of people like students from Lviv, like 22, 21 years old, who developed this service for digital police. They grab data from the government, uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs and do the security application that tells you if you are entering the dangerous area in the dangerous hour and sends the same notification to all of your relatives. Or, for example, there are guys who are doing agriculture. They are providing the application for super small collective enterprises of Ukrainian farmers. And they grab data from the government about the uh, chemical ingredients of the soil. And um, they also do some drones and some other stuff to, to do the temperature and uh, humidity of the soil. And they provide the app to those farmers who cannot allow expensive solutions to them. And uh, also there, is a, there are guys who are doing the counting of uh, freight carriages and basically help the Minister of Infrastructure to do this job and basically to organize the effective booking of the carriages. Uh, or there are some other guys uh, who united all the database of uh, uh, donor blood and you can actually purchase the blood from the, blood, the donor center at the hour that you want and you can get the quality that you want and uh, actually prevent any kind of frauds in this business. 
And uh, there are many more to come, which could only ha happen in Ukraine, like money transfer from military zone to the uh, peaceful part of Ukraine. And uh, I think that most of these services are really successful, not only Ukraine, but they go to neighboring countries. Again, thanks to Western NAS, some startups went to DMZ Toronto I uh, acceleration program last year. Uh, others uh, went to Techstars in London, and uh, some projects work with the government of Dubai right now. Uh, we have launched the recent fintech program, for example, and that fintech challenge, uh, challenge led uh, the, uh, to a success of uh, uh, five Ukrainian startups out of eight selected that went to work with Hungarian banks right now. So we definitely show different models, and I think it's not... Uh, it's not the capital, but rather human capital and uh, the models that are being invented in Ukraine that show to the rest of Eastern Europe that it's really viable. And uh, it, 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 coming back to the government, I think government is the main task setter of challenges in Ukraine right now. The government is overseeing many things and uh, doesn't have enough resources to manage them all. And that's why they are ha happy to have such a projects, startups, and investors who can combine their efforts and help to resolve these challenges. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of a synergy happening there. Thank you. I, I'll take uh, maybe a couple of questions. Is it the mic, guys? Uh, uh, it's back. It's back. Oh, it's back. <laughs> <laughs> Raise your hand if you have a question. I'll go next to you. Hi, um, my name is Mbai Kajese. I'm uh, from Zimbabwe. I'm based in South Africa. I'm building a startup, and my, develop my developing team is actually from Lviv in the Ukraine. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and they're, they're called Kind Geek, by the way, if you want to use them. <laughs> and I chose them because um, one, they, um, they, they had the, the startup experience to handhold a new a new startup um, that's trying to get into Silicon Valley. Two, there was that uh, the time difference factor. It worked. It worked for us. But three, there was also the cost and, and obviously the experience. And I noticed there was a lot of synergies in how, say, Ukraine can help the up and coming ecosystem in Africa boom, right? Um, but I think there's more opportunities, and I'd like to know what your suggestions are for that, because you have Estonia that has introduced the e-residency, and that's going to help um, uh, some of our, us startups which have payment gateway issues that we can't do with the West because of where we're located. So I was wondering if, you know, what are your suggestions or what you see in the future going forward? Because there's obviously a market for this, for this uh, between Ukraine and African countries or other developing countries to really help bridge that gap where we can't use Western uh, technology, for example. Can, can we take maybe one, two more questions? So, uh, civic tech, impact investment, any, anything you've heard that uh, you can... I'm a, I'm a free software developer. What's, what are your thoughts on governments, democratic governments, working together to realize that we can share technology pretty cheaply and freely with each other. So for example, we're working on an open ledger project, so publicly accountable ledger and immutable on the blockchain. Uh, it works. Uh, just how, how, do, how do we get the governments to work together for the technology that we can replicate across where we have similar, similar needs? Anybody else? The one, two? Okay. Uh, I don't know what question, I call it. No, we'll go to your question. Okay. Go to you. Um, I, I also had a question around, you know, um, Prozoro and some of the motivations behind having the government accept this and want ha be motivated to implement because I want this in Canada. <laughs> you know, I want <laughs> I want what Ukraine has in Canada and how do I get that, you know, implemented in my my country? So so maybe if I could sum up if I could sum up the the questions. One is um you know, the, the very modern, the very latest, uh, the blockchain, is there space for it to, to create more transparency, more efficiency with government, more honesty in our democracy? And the other question is, is uh, um, 
is maybe over to you, uh, Denise. Uh, maybe you start, since, since there were a lot of focus on Ukraine. Yeah, of course. So, uh, <coughs> basically, uh, going back to Africa, I've been to a great reception of South African government a couple of days ago here in Davos, and I met the entire government team. Amazing people, found, found really interesting ideas, and uh, I think that uh, there is a lot of room for collaboration between Ukraine and South Africa because mm, a lot of, uh, as you mentioned, a lot of Ukrainian IT professionals are moving to South Africa because they just go for a retreat and they just stay. Mm -hmm. Because a beautiful country, a lot of opportunities, and they fi find themselves in the middle of heaven. So I think that most of tools that were created in Ukraine in the recent years, they were all sponsored by donors which means that they could be easily transferred to those countries where these donors do operate. And it's just the question of initiating this process. Participatory budgeting, uh, open procurement, uh, open declarations, uh, probably some other systems like open treasury and transactions, and uh, a lot of other tools that are being developed, they all are sponsored by donors. And uh, I think it can really be done. And Basically, I think that's just the conversation that should be started. Uh, on the other hand, I think that it partially uh, has uh, something to do with Canada. But uh, I think that in most of uh, uh, developed countries, uh, governments are in a position to afford procurement or acquisition of something that is at the market. And there are a lot of commercial companies already doing something and they can do, if, even if they sell open procurement system, for example, they can definitely do one f on, f on demand. And uh, this is something that we could see with the United States when our projects were presented there. There are a lot of commercial competitors. But who knows, maybe it, it, it can work like that because Canada was definitely having a sufficient contribution in Ukraine and this could be a, a decent payoff. Um, I would rather not touch the question blockchain. Uh, no, no, I, I wanted to, uh, to go to... And I, I, I uh, wanted to say that yeah. uh, maybe Alicia has some perspectives in the region because you are definitely having contests in this part of the world. And if yes. you could see the talent coming up, if they have any attachment to the government? Yeah, uh, so civic tech is still, at, it's not the sexiest industry. So in terms of trends that we see and we receive over kind of 10,000 applications per year across 80 markets, um, it's more around financial inclusion and you're very big this year on agriculture. And so kind of where there is this big hype where investment is going, we tend to see then the waves quite globally actually. Um, but civic tech is taking rise in specific industries in the sense, for example, waste management. There has been models where there's a better understanding of how to monetize it. And so suddenly you start attracting better talent, you start attracting funding, you start attracting the different kind of um, stakeholders to discuss it. Um, and more importantly, where government is very difficult to become the client, you start having private clients that can prove the model, so then government becomes the client in due time. Um, and there we see very interesting incentivization models of crowdsourcing the information or having this collaborative economy of everyone chipping in to make it possible. And there are really nice examples uh, in Africa, Eastern Europe, even Asia of, of, of uh, companies that have understood how to manage recycling, how to manage waste management, how to manage the switch systems on their own, because as mentioning for Nigeria, but most of these parts of the region, infrastructure is not something of a public good. So infrastructure comes from the private and hopefully the private is able to educate the government on how to provide a decentralized, low cost solution for a low tech population. And I think that really is something for those that are interested in impact investing that have to understand about context is that in many ways you are part of, you are part of this elite. And if not elite, you are a small percentage of people that have enormous access to knowledge, infrastructure, network, and much more tech savvy. And we've seen many times the biggest errors in looking at civic tech, et cetera, not understanding the local context from this kind of elitist approach of thinking to understand what are the needs or what are the complexities of the local market. So for example, when we look at 
micro loans, many people were very shocked by the interest rates, things like that. But you don't understand that banks locally are giving 35% and over half of the population doesn't even have access to potential bank loans. So what are the other opportunities? How do you tackle this? The, 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 these, these economies probably are more financially savvy than you because every day they have to ask themselves how to manage their cash flow to be able to go um, onto the, the second stage of their inventory for their small businesses or to manage a fire crisis and there is no insurance and there is no uh, way to pay back. So from there you find very creative business models but you really, really have to understand the context. If not, we are missing opportunities of receiving, receiving also um, intelligent investment but also of understanding how creative and how different these business models are going to scale in these markets. And so with government, it's the same thing. It's true that I, I do believe, and Ukraine kind of proved it in many ways, that it was from the, the uprise of the, of the crowd that we were able to finally prove some models and have someone, a government on the other side, very receptive in collaborating because other governments are still extremely fearful of this transparency issue and how much accountability they have to give in to. Um, but then starts getting you start going to get more and more startups and 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 in general businesses that are going to start going antagonist against the government. It's going to be much worse. Huh? And today you're seeing deputies being followed. Uh, you have these websites of uh, the the true information, and this can get out of control very quickly. So. Ultimately, government, it's in their best interest to be very open-minded and collaborative in these discussions because it can backfire and we can lose control of these different kind of entities that are growing, which is not very constructive in the growth and the sustainability of these economies. Well, thank you for, for giving us some, uh, some, something to chew on, some information there. Uh, I, you know, I want. I, I love your question. I think it's it's what occupies my mind a lot. Is that, like, my favorite author now is Yuval Harari, who's um, uh, hypothesized that we are pushing towards the era where free choice is a phenomenon because machines will be better at, at making decisions than us. So algorithms will know what's in our interest before we'll know. What, what does that even mean for government? Like how, you know, how's this, the trust mechanisms, is it, first thing is automation, you know, digital residency, digital ID, all the rest of it. But if we think 50 years into the future, 100 years, and, and the data will be framing for all decisions and we might be kind of removed from that process altogether. Uh, Jean-Baptiste, you dealt with digital strategy. Like uh, yeah. maybe they'll go into hundred years forward, but uh, no. Like, but share I, I, some thoughts. I've been advising the French government for five years on digital technologies, and I don't think governments today are uh, opposite to anything like that. Actually, the blockchain is is actually developing very well in a lot of Western countries. Uh, we are building more and more stuff. But the thing is, what should be achieved? Because every country is different, and if you want to build, for example, we could use a blockchain to notarize real estate in France. But what for? It's already there and it's working and it's cheap. So what should we, should we do that? But for other countries, it's actually very important. So you see, it will really depend and I don't think we'll have a uniform landscape at the end of the day for some things, yes. For example, digital residency is actually becoming something very important for so many businesses all over the world. Estonia is booming thanks to that, and many other countries are beginning to adopt a similar system. In France, we have something called uh, the Talent Passport, uh, which allows foreigners to come and uh, be welcomed in France and create companies in France. And so you will see good ideas being replicated everywhere, but not everything. It won't happen, that's for sure. And it's also sort of one thing to think, what kind of government do we want to have in 5, 10, 50 years? I don't believe it will be small governments. I don't believe it at all, because the less we work, the actually we will want to have public management more and more, because we'll have more time, uh, we'll have more agency, more autonomy, and we will have, we will want to have more public and collective decisions on more and more things. So we'll have a bigger government with actually more employees in the government. But maybe they won't be the same 
than the ones we have today. Because we won't accept to have the same government than today, but bigger. So we will ask them to transform, but their missions will go and go and go and, and grow. And maybe some companies that we think about today as companies, and that's maybe one of the aim of civic tech and, uh, and impact investing. Maybe some missions that we think as being missions of companies today will actually be considered to be missions of the government in the future, but they will be achieved through private companies, through not-for-profit association, these kind of things. I have one example for, 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 for example, just to, to, to end this. Um, in France, um, one of my friend uh, actually, uh, he, he, he went back from Y Combinator in the US and he arrived and he was surprised that nobody was using artificial intelligence in order to uh, optimize uh, unemployment issues. And basically he had one idea. If you get um, an, an unemployed people and he doesn't know what to do next because he would like to work in this, but in order to work in that company or in that function, you have to do you have to get educated to do that. You need to learn English. You need to do go to that school and so on. Maybe for three months or four months or something like that. Not that complicated, but you need to orient it a little bit. And you can really easily automatize it because you have previous examples and then you will be able to, to adjust it because uh, uh, maybe we'll tell him, oh, you shouldn't do that because it will lead to nowhere. So don't go to that school, but go to that other one because there you will learn something that will be useful in six months, not in two years, and so on. And actually he did it, but instead of doing it in the government or as a private company, he did an, an, a not-for-profit association. He, he got funding, he got funding from the French government, he got funding from Google, he got funding from the French unemployment agency, and voila, it worked. And as of today, it's efficient and working and so on. And also, just maybe one last thing, uh, you mentioned that there is one thing we need to understand. Uh, do we want governments to be efficient or legitimate? Because it's one thing to startups try to be legit, uh, to be efficient and so on. The, the digital paradigm is always about efficiency. But at the end of the day, I'm really okay to trade a little bit of efficiency for a lot of legitimacy. You see what I mean? So we should have that in mind. And sometimes, yeah, governments are not that efficient. But well, at least I can vote and decide who the government. You see, I will never decide who will be uh, on the board of Google. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe on that note, we wrap up and uh, I'll... <laughs> Sorry, sorry. I, 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 I want to respect the time. We're at three or five. But hold your question. You can talk to the panel. Would you do? Yeah. No, okay. Okay. Very good. I, I'll say just maybe three things to, to kind of summarize what I believe is a consensus here, is uh, the public goods and private goods are are merging into one, yeah. and tech trends are, in some way, a force behind it. There is a you know, we talk about civic tech as an independent phenomena from just tech, and, and again, if we look at the big mega trends, it seems like that could also again merge into just one thing. Uh, and then doing well by doing good is, is, is seem like a niche, uh, yet it's, it's becoming uh, a norm. And, uh, and I, you know, I look forward to that world, I think. It's good that we have a bit of optimism, a bit of interesting examples to share, and uh, and I think that's actually a good note to, to end the session. Uh, before we clap, before we close, I also wanted to, uh, to invite Alexa for just one quick comment. Thank you to a truly wonderful panel. It's a terrific way to wrap up the week here at the first ever Ukraine House in Davos. So thank you very much. And to our guests, thank you for engaging with Ukraine House and thank you for your interest in investing in Ukraine. Um, we look forward to continuing the dialogue here. And on that note, we warmly welcome you to start now with a reception, a, a lunch and a reception. So please do stay and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.